Welcome back to Live with the Mod the Poet, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different. Today we have a great guest and somebody who embodies one of Rev One's most fundamental philosophies, which is freedom, not only creatively, but ideologically. We have an artist, a writer, some would say philosopher, stylist, Aisha Akambi. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you for, um, for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Finally meeting you in the flesh. Yes, yes. It's a pleasure to have you on. My sister's name is actually Aisha. Oh, really? I don't know if I, I, I love, mentioned that to no, you. No, you haven't. I love that. I wanted to ask you, um, just to start off, and um, ask you, how do you start off your day? Like, what, what starting off, like, what's your kind of flow to get your, your day started off creatively and just, like, work-wise? What is something that kind of helps you get in the good workflow? All right. Well, you know, there's there's two answers to that. There is the ideal Aisha on good days, uh, and then there's the Aisha that can kind of slip into habits. Um, but the ideal me um, often starts my day. I meditate. Um, my mind is constantly racing, uh, often way faster than I can keep up with, and it can feel quite overwhelming. And so I found that meditation in recent years has really been good for that and in centering me and allowing me to sort of to observe the thoughts rather than get so caught up in them. Um, I journal. Um, I try to stay off my phone uh, until like the afternoon or something like that. Um, but that's, if there was anything, I would say probably those two are the two kind of consistent. I don't always, you know, there's some days where I can just reach for my phone and do what we all do, doom scroll. Um, but no, uh, for the most part, yeah, I try to keep at least those two things, you know, help me feel a bit more sane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So would you say you view yourself as like an artist or more like a creative? And I don't, if, is there a difference between an artist and a creative? And what is the importance of freedom in those type of spaces? Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm so reluctant for whatever reason to self-define. Um, I think some people see me as an artist. Some people may use the word creative just because that's probably the term that is most common. Um, creative is probably a word that I shy away from the most, maybe because any word that gets overused, I think can sometimes lose its meaning or just be a bit lazy. Um, I admire artists. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily label it, but let's say I do a bit of all of that. So yeah, a lot of my work is artistic, maybe around fashion and styling. I've been a fashion stylist for maybe 12, 13 years now. Um, some of my work is maybe a little bit more it's a bit more heady, you know, it's a bit more, it has a bit more of a philosophical approach. Um, but you know what, I think for me, I'm always just trying to do everything that inspires me, everything that's fun, everything I wanted to do as a kid, that's also a really big thing for me. So a lot of the things that I do now are the things that I wanted to do when I was a child. Um, and I think, you know, when we are children, before we've kind of learned about limitations and before we've kind of made assessments about who we should be based on what we think, you know, the world wants. Um, I try to go back to that because that feels like the most pure to me. So yeah, I've been DJing a lot recently and you know, I do some writing. So it really is a mix of them all. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to kind of straddle them all. And I don't know, I guess I'm not so interested in, in defining it for myself. I, you know, whatever other people feel for me, I guess that is partly true. And the reason I ask is, I feel like words are something that like you're very specific on. Like I saw a ton of your interviews and you're really specific about your words. And what do you feel like is the importance of us coming to a collective understanding of a definition? Because sometimes we have like two different definitions for one word. Um, do you feel like that's important in terms of like how we go about dealing with ideolo ideology and, and just understanding each other's perspectives on life? Yeah, 100%. I think so much of the collective cultural and political disarray that we see right now is because language has broken down quite dramatically. Um, and I think people are primed to say what they see repeated all of the time. Um, and for me, um, language is so important because it's the way that people know you. It's the way that they can really connect with you. Um, I really don't want to 
pass through this life only saying half of what I meant because I used someone else's words. And so it's just really important for me to try and be as precise as I can uh, with what I mean, which is something that I think uh, we've lost. You know, right now, people don't necessarily have a collective understanding of what violence means, of what racism means, of what being a woman means. You know, the list is endless. Um, and I do think, you know, this is some of the source of the problems that we see today. Um, so yeah, definitely um, using your own words is something that I always um, encourage and, and try to promote. Um, and maybe I get why we haven't done that. I think it's, it's difficult sometimes. You know, I think anyone who attempts to write knows the, the grueling agony sometimes of trying to get the right word. And so it's much easier to reach for something that you see everybody using. And not only that, I think certain words that we use today, they, um, they sort of belong in certain ideological camps. So if you want to kind of show yourself to be perhaps a good activist, you might use the term problematic more. If you want to show yourself to be, um, you know, uh, a devout anti-racist, you know, you might use the term institutional racism. And again, even that's a term that's very contested. And I think when people use it, have all different, people use it and have all different types of understandings of what that means. When, when did, would you say like, you understood the power of your voice. Like it actually became a realization that your voice has power and the things that you say have power. Because a lot of us feel like, you know, they, we're not as specific with our words or specific about the things that we say because we don't see the power in it. But when, we, when would you say was the moment where it kind of clicked for you? Like, I don't want to use somebody else's words to express myself. I don't want to, you know, latch on to somebody else's philosophies. What I believe and what I say is a representation of me and it will go on for like, eons into the future like it, it's important for me to define what I feel you know probably through reading if I'm honest probably uh, I think it was so I read a lot as a child um, I was you know I grew up as an only child with my mom uh, I do have siblings but they're on my dad's side and they never lived with me so I grew up as an only child and often didn't have very much to do but my mom had books in the house um, and I read a lot as a kid and then grew up, you know, you become a teenager, you want to fit in, you want to do whatever people perceive as cool. And I kind of fell out of touch with that for a really long time. And then um, around 2012, I had a massive turning point in my life uh, where I was forced to start reading again because the kinds of things that I was thinking about and the kinds of questions that I had were just certainly not the types of questions that generally come up um, in a social gathering. They're the kinds of things that might upset the mood or, yeah, or something like that. And so I started reading and I found that, yeah, many of the writers that I came across at the time, um, they were able to express themselves in a way that you know, it was both a, a gut punch and a hug. Uh, and, I, and it was really powerful to me. Um, and I think from there, that's when I started understanding uh, the importance of, of, of choosing your own words and expressing yourself as clearly as you can. It's funny because like, I think some people in recent years have complimented that aspect of me and it's still the part of me that I feel needs probably, you know, some of the most work. Um, because, yeah, I think, um, I think I'm very hyper aware of the fact that, you know, life isn't forever. And so I, I guess with the people that I come across and the people that I meet, um, in order for us to have the most sincere connection, I feel like, yeah, expressing myself in, in, my, in my own words makes the most sense for me. And maybe I started understanding that my voice had some type of impact uh, maybe through using social media, which I never, I didn't have any plan, you know, I didn't think of myself as a content creator. I think at the time that I was using social media, uh, the word content creator wasn't as, it wasn't as prevalent in the culture as it is now. And yeah, I think that taught me something. Yeah. So I think social media and seeing people resonate and respond to the things that I was thinking and feeling, uh, also made me feel like a heightened sense of responsibility about not just what I say, but how I say it. Something you talk about as well is like the natural desire to belong. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like being a free thinker is about like rejecting the whole ideology of belonging in itself, or is it like finding where you truly belong, or is it like something in the middle or completely different? Yeah, I think, you know, often when there seems to be a topic or a theme that keeps coming up in the things that I'm expressing publicly, it might be something that I am wrestling with within myself. And I think belonging has been something that I have often wanted. So I came through um, a world of fashion and style and, and people were very sort of Let's say I was around a lot of people that would be described as socialites. And I, I soon recognized that I didn't really quite fit there and never really had, um, but I looked the part. And so I was always able to be accepted in a lot of those spaces. And then when my ideas and the things that I was thinking about changed a bit more, I found myself in groups with activists, um, or at least people who describe themselves as activists, and often recognize that that didn't really fit either. Um, and then, you know, you go to the internet, as many people do, when they feel somewhat alienated by their peers, or they're trying to seek some kind of community. And there was things online and communities, let's say I was on the peripheries of, the. I don't know if I would say resonated, but at least I understood. I understood a lot more than a lot that was in my immediate surroundings. But yeah, still I wouldn't say I resonated with it. Um, and I think I've got to a point in myself where accepting myself is more important than belonging. And I think another reason why we see a lot of the cultural and political mayhem that we do is because of this powerful need people have to belong. Um, and people want to belong these days purely through their political ideas, which to me can actually be quite shallow, if I'm honest. Yeah, I actually think that's, I think that's shallow, you know. Um, I think connecting through shared experiences, shared pain, shared insecurities, anxieties, um, the things that keep us up at night. Um, I don't know, I find a lot more depth in that um, and so and that can come from anyone from any ideological side you know I don't mind at all that doesn't really have a hindrance really on how I see people people come to their political beliefs through all types of means through their family through yeah you know through various means um, so yeah I think belonging tends to be the thing that, or sorry, or our need, that powerful need that we have to belong to a tribe, to a circle, to people who see the world in the way that we do, often seems to limit people's voice and expression. Um, I think it encourages uh, a lot of, a lot of groupthink. Um, and yeah, I, I just uh, would rather not be engaged in that just because it, it just feels insincere. So do you think there's a better way to go about advocacy than like allyship? Because uh, I remember on your um, interview on trigonometry, you talked about not wanting an ally. Do you think there's a, a better way to go about like advocacy or is there a way to go about like advocating for maybe your peers or friends, something that they, or is it something that maybe shouldn't be required? Is it something that should just come from the heart? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, even the words ally and allyship, again, it's, it's, not, it's not my language. I get that that's the way that we talk about supporting other groups now. But yeah, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't resonate with me. Um, I think, you know, if there was a, a group of people, a community that I felt passionately about and I felt that they were overlooked or treated badly in some way, I don't know if what I'm doing is allyship. That feels really stale and sterile to me, or at least in the in the context of today, it does. Um, I don't know. Being curious about people, truly getting to to know them, to understand them, not speaking for them, um, for me feels like a better approach. But then again, I, I don't necessarily consider myself an activist, so I wouldn't necessarily know the best way for people to go about that. But. I don't know, there just seems to be something in the word allyship uh, and being an ally that just for me feels, again, quite insincere uh, and performative. It feels a bit empty and hollow. Um, so, 
No, uh, I, I, for me, um, yeah, sorry, I don't even know how to answer it. Uh, was just there ever a time that you kind of like bought into that whole construct? Of like there was definitely a time where I was a lot more sympathetic to the sort of ideas uh, around bettering the world um, than I am today. Um, I think at that point, I was of the belief that, you know, anybody who vocally and passionately spoke about wanting to help another group, I thought they had gone through some sort of inward journey first um, that had led them to that point. You know, I didn't necessarily know that people were using this as um, a justification to hate other groups or, a, you know, a justification to exercise the cruelty they accuse other people of. You know, I didn't really know that. I was quite naive coming into this space and I thought everybody knew more than me because I knew nothing about politics. Um, and I just assumed that if, you know, you had some Marxist language or, or you know, that you you must know what you're talking about. But if you'd read all of these books, then you must know something that I didn't. Um, and I think what I was actually looking for, um, which is maybe something more akin to maybe what you would call self-mastery. You know, I think that was really important to me. I looked at the world and I thought to myself that, okay, the reason as to why people exploit, the reason as to why people are hateful and, and do a lot of harmful things to each other is more internal. It has stuff more to do with what's happening internally and psychologically. And that was more my interest. So if all of these ills that we're seeing in the world are a manifestation of what's ever happening in our psychology, then it makes more sense to pay attention to our minds and our habits and things like that. Uh, and that first had to start with me. Um, and I think in many of the, the circles that I found myself falling into, that didn't seem to be their approach. Um, and once I recognized that, once I recognized that I think a lot of people would happily commit many of the acts that they find unspeakable in the name of creating a world that they want. Well, I just didn't see any difference between, you know, those people and the people they oppose. Um, so yeah, that's probably what made me less sympathetic. I still try to maybe take, maybe what I wouldn't call sympathetic, but an understanding tone to the things that I dislike and the things that trouble me, um, just because I feel like I don't know, it's much more interesting for me to, let's say, um, it's much more interesting for me to, to be heard or to be listened to by people who don't agree with me, you know, or people who've been taught that they should think a certain way because if they do, that makes them a good person. You know, um, having a pat on the back from people who already see things the way I do is a lot less intriguing or it feels it doesn't feel as worthwhile for me and so I think in order to do that if you are going to land with people who disagree with you and who've been taught maybe even that your ideas are dangerous I think your tone and the way that you address that is really quite important. So do you enjoy a good debate or is it just more about coming to a common understanding? Um, I enjoy a debate with someone who can debate and who won't necessarily um, use a difference of opinion to sort of suggest that there's a difference of morality, you know, which I think is really common today. Um, so yeah, I think if I don't feel like I have to tread on eggshells around someone, um, then I'm happy to kind of have like quite a fierce debate. Um, but more than anything, I'm always quite interested in why do people think the way that they think? Um, and understanding why people think the way that they think really sort of um, stimulates a lot of thinking and writing for me. You know, it's a, it's a really good, um, it's, very, it's very provoking in a way that I, I quite enjoy. And I think uh, it's, you get closer to insight there as opposed to just opinion. Um, and I think in general, maybe that's again why I eventually sort of found myself in this position where I, I stopped looking for like where I belong and you know, like am I on this side or am I on that side? I think what I'm looking for is insightful people. Um, and I think that comes from a different place. I think that very much comes from like leading with understanding before judgment, which isn't to say that people don't judge, but at least prioritizing understanding over judgment. Uh, because I think that makes the world a lot less scary for you when you, when you move in that way. Could you talk about the importance of like operating from, you call it the heart space, um, 
than like purely purely intellectual and the importance of that, you know, because sometimes, and I like when you touched on that point as well on, on the last conversation that you had, um, powerful conversation that you had with Solomon, Africa Brook, and just about coming from the heart space and the importance sometimes us in this space, sometimes we can over intellectualize things and sometimes just coming from the heart makes things just to just roll out a little bit better, you know, and, and especially when you're talking about tough topics or tough concepts to like add the warmth of just like coming from the heart space. Like, could you talk about the importance of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, again, there is something about when you are led purely by your intellectualism or when you're led purely by the mind when you're approaching topics that for other people are very emotional, they're coming from all types of places. Um, it just doesn't seem to, it just doesn't land well. And also, again, I keep using this word hollow, um, but there is something that feels really quite hollow and again, quite sterile in that. Um, and it can get to a point where I think you're just sort of, you're just trying to flex how intelligent you are. You're just trying to flex, you know, some kind of muscle there that at least is quite see-through to me. I think if the issues that you care about are as grave and as important as you say they are, then I think it really does, um, or I think it's very worthwhile to approach it from a different place so people can actually hear you, not just the people who, again, who already agree with you. Again, for me, that just becomes a big circle jerk. Um, and I'm... Um, not as interested in that. Um, and I think, again, whether people use that term or not, I think it can be felt. Um, there are so many people who say exactly the same sort of things as I'm saying, but the energy where that's coming from can be felt even if people can't articulate it. Um, so that's why, for me, coming from that space, and also I think we have to kind of be, I think when you are also led by, you know, love or your heart as well I think that also that's also because you know you remember where you've been you remember all the stupid ideas that you've had you know you remember when you were easily led or when you've done all these things um and I think if you're aware of that it's really hard to kind of enter the situation as if you're above it you know I may not be there anymore but I'm not necessarily above it or I haven't always been above that type of thing and so because I'm fairly aware of that, um, and I think we all should be because, you know, a lot of people have come from ideas that they no longer hold anymore that they're criticizing. And I think if you, you know, if you're aware of where you were when you adopted those ideas, uh, that should at least allow you to move with uh, a little more humanity. Mm. What would you describe as like a, a healthy relationship in terms of government or establishment in um, citizen, um, do you do you see any like country or, or place out in the world that has like a good kind of mixture, a good relationship that you would say, or what would your ideal like government to citizen relationship be? I don't know. I don't know if I'm best placed to answer that question, and I don't know if the, you know the way that my mind is set up is necessarily looking for that. I think what I am looking for is for us to be a lot more community orientated truly and to not necessarily defer always to government and to the state to fix all of our problems. Because I do think, um, you know, we have so much more power. And I think maybe one of the greatest kind of tricks that's been played on us collectively is, you know, making us feel quite powerless. And so I'm much more interested in how we as smaller communities can address the things that are most important to us. Um, I think someone who has a bit more of a, of a political mind would be best, better placed to answer that question. But for me, um, I don't like feeling powerless myself. And I don't like feeling like I have to wait for someone else to come in and fix a problem. I don't like feeling uh, as though, sorry, I don't like being framed as a victim or being framed as oppressed when I'm clearly not. Um, and so, yeah, I would like us to kind of recognize the collective strength and power and agency that we have in our lives to transform them. Mm. You talk about the difference between um, principles and beliefs and how beliefs are fleeting and, and principles are kind of what withstand those like changes through life. Could you talk about the importance of like having strong principles? Yeah, I think 
I think my principles are, you know, often what lead me to a lot of my beliefs or the way that I try to operate in the world. And I think what I mean by that, for instance, I, I think a good example is if you truly believe that um, judging people by the color of their skin, their ethnicity, religious, you know, religious background, if you truly believe that that is wrong, well, then you can't get on board with doing that to other people just because they might be the majority of the group. You know what I mean? Or just because, you know, you think that group has more power. Um, it's, yeah, so for me, uh, principles should inform your beliefs. Uh, principles are what stops me from just adopting a certain position or saying something online just because I know that there's a lot of, I don't know, social currency in doing that. Um, and I think, you know, again, we are in a, a situation right now where I think people think to be a good person is to have certain beliefs. Um, and, you know, you can always be almost sold to the highest bidder in, in that, if that's the way that you operate in the world, you know. And it just, again, it just feels, it just doesn't feel like it has much integrity in it. Um, so I think, yeah, developing stronger principles, um, I think then you kind of can withstand, you know, having to, I don't know, change positions every few months because, I don't know, the ideological winds have changed and now all of a sudden, you know, that thing that you were saying two months ago is problematic. Um, I don't know, I just think also principles kind of, let's say, like, I think they make you slower to form, like, judgments and slower to kind of, like, adopt positions. You're more likely to, you know, really try and get your head around something first before you feel pressured by your peers to just comment on something. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, where I was or the way that I framed it when I was talking about principles and beliefs, but there is definitely something that I see there. Like, a lot of people have opinions, but they don't have principles. It's maybe what I'm picking up on. And I do like that concept because I heard you talk about that, like um, victimhood and how it's like almost it's in our hearts or minds, it's become synonymous with like innocence. Mm. And then um, I was like, wow. Um, and just how to address yourself in the solution and the problem is not something that a lot of us can do or like the what or who that started the problem. We can address like the solution, we can address the problem, but often we don't address who started it because it makes us the problem right, it makes us right. not innocent and I just felt like that was like such a powerful concept yeah I, I think so I mean you can be a victim and also uh, an aggressor you can be you can be both of those things um, and I, I don't think we recognize that enough um, and yeah victimhood is not synonymous with innocence but I think because we have this idea again it's not articulated this way and it's never spelled out but there is a reason as to why you know, we're so, so many of us, especially younger people, are so desperate to kind of um, identify with what they consider to be a, an oppressed group, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think it's because, like, if you are oppressed, we've kind of taken on this idea that, like, yeah, you're pure, you know? Like, everyone is against you. Um, and that's just um, not true. Um, and if we were going to do that, you know, even if we were going to take a concept like... Um, generational trauma or something like that, then everybody has that because most people's histories are pretty complex and filled with a lot of atrocities. Um, so I don't know, the thing about this victimhood thing is, is where does it stop? Because everybody, or most people should I say, uh, and I, I guess it could be everybody, you know, behaves in a certain way that is harmful um, because of certain reasons, you know what I mean? Um, and so it just never seems to stop to me. So again, yeah, just, but also beyond that, um, I don't think people are necessarily victims in the way that they've been taught to think of that. You know, I know a lot of people, for instance, who might be queer, they identify as queer, and they'll say to me that they're oppressed and, you know, they live in America or they live in Britain, you know, and they can buy homes, you know, they can be with who they want to be with, they can get jobs. In fact, many of them are successful. Um, and I, when they say this, I, am, I, don't, I don't really understand it. Like, so if that's oppression, do you know what I mean? I, I, again, I just think it's, you know, we've just decided that, you know, if you belong to a certain category, then you're automatically that. People don't even take stock of everything that's happening in their lives that, you know, completely... Uh, calls that into question. 
Do you feel like with your writing, it's easier to take like the kid gloves off? Because I know you talk about, you know, just talk about debating and how they have to be, you, if you're debating with somebody, they have to be in the right mind frame to actually debate with you. But like writing and addressing topics like that, do you feel like you're more apt to address something like that regardless of like, um, because people, that, that's such a clear truth, but a lot of people might not take that the right way. Do you feel like it's something that is kind of like you just let it be there and then go about your day? Well, I don't know. I would just ask the person, you know, if, 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 if someone was to say that to me, I would just say, in, in what way do you believe that you're oppressed, considering you can do all of those things that so I just So it's more listed. of a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then maybe than making them, them yeah. kind of come to it themselves, mm. you know, and often they'll see that they've just said this because it's just in the ether, mm. you know, but there's no actual... There's no actual evidence that backs up you feeling that way. Um, you know, so many of my friends or people that I've met who say these things are more successful than many people I know, you know, who are not queer. Um, so, yeah, it's sometimes it's just asking questions and getting people to interrogate their ideas a little more rigorously. Mm. Would, would you say there was ever a time where you felt like a victim or like victimized or related or associated to victimhood? Yes, but um, the times in which I felt victimized, it wasn't necessarily due to any external group. It was maybe more, maybe more personal, maybe more family orientated. You know, I think we all go through that stage where we blame our moms for how we are. You know, we blame our parents for what we don't have. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely went through a powerful and embarrassing stage of that at a certain point. Uh, I'm happy to say I'm no longer there. Um, but again, I think what stopped me from being there is just thinking about what has my mother been through? Mm. You know, why am I not asking that question? You know, like, why am I not asking, you know, what's brought her to, you know, make some of the decisions that she's made? And yeah, and again, it just, it just started to crumble. And honestly, I do have a, a terrific, you know, wonderful mum, and she's like my best friend. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's probably even from there that I speak. I think I understand the need when so much, or you feel like so much in your life is out of control. And it's like, where do I put this? You know, it's a lot to deal with the, 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 the idea that your life is the sum of your choices. Mm. You know, that's a really hard thing to accept. Um, and even now there can be moments where I, um, I could be struggling to do something. And I see my mind want to go to, it's because you didn't have this. You know what I mean? I can see it and I'm like, bring it back, bring it back. You know, um, and it's so easy to do. And if I can still see my mind wanting to do that now, it's because I didn't go to this school. It's because I wasn't exposed to this, you know, or whatever it may be. I can see how easily, you know, people, people get there. And it goes back to an earlier point that we was talking about, um, even before we, we got on camera, just about, Location and how people want to be in certain major cities because they feel like, well, it hasn't popped for me yet because I'm not there. If I was in that place, it would work. Right. And it's often uh, a work ethic and just a resourcefulness that really plays into a lot of people's success and those type of things. Could you? T but the reason I asked the question is like, I wanted to, because a lot of people they feel like, what is the the empowerment of just taking on that responsibility and taking on like no, I'm not a victim. Like, what is the actual empowerment behind that? Like, what is the power that comes with owning your problems? Like, because a lot of people just feel like it's just me saying some words, like me just self-proclaiming that I did this. But like, what is the true empowerment in that? Self-respect, dignity, I would say. Um, to know that you can direct your life. I don't believe that you can have a healthy level of esteem whilst thinking that, you know, the world is against you in some way or that you don't have control in your life. I know that I can't, you know, and I can, like I said, I, I watch my mind and I can have moments where things are challenging, where I'm wanting to slip into that. And I can see how it makes me feel internally. You know, I don't feel good. And so, being able to walk into any room, irrespective of what color people are, where they've gone to school, their education background, and all of these kind of things, and be able to hold your own is a beautiful thing. It's something money can't buy, you know? Uh, it's a wealth in itself. Um, and, and that's really, really powerful. Um, and again, it's one of the reasons why I've pushed back, you know, quite consistently against some of the ideas surrounding race. You know, I don't want people, I don't want black people to feel like if they go into certain rooms, everyone is automatically looking down on them, you know? Um, 
again, like you can't have healthy esteem and maintain these types of ideas. For one, it's not true. Most people are often thinking about themselves and don't actually care, you know. But secondly, like you're just sort of, I guess you're just projecting. You're projecting how you feel onto other people. Um, and it's sad. It's sad to know that that's how so many people feel. And they may not be able to read the subtext beneath what many of these ideas are suggesting. But that is what, you know, it's quite clear and loud, you know, uh, for many people to see that that is what's going on in the background. Um, I don't want to be part of a chorus that allows people who already view black people in ways um, that are demeaning. I don't want to give those kind of people any more reason to think that they have any sort of power over how I see myself. And I don't think anybody should. What would you say is the importance of resourcefulness when it comes to like being an artist and a stylist or just in life in general, but um, for your career and specifically, what is the importance of resourcefulness? I guess I'm, uh, you know, a believer in, you know, I think that was, a, you know, it's a quite a popular saying is like, start where you are with what you have. And, you know, I can't remember how the rest of it goes, but I do believe that there is so much more to our disposal than we think. Um, and so, you know, if that's taking yourself to a local library, if you don't have books in the house, if that's reaching out to people and talking to them, like, you know, we spend so much time on social media, but the internet is, is big, you know, there's so much that you can learn. And I don't necessarily think people who are yet to achieve their dreams, I don't necessarily think it's always about a lack of talent or a lack of resources or not having the right educational background. I think it's, you know, the unwillingness to be persistent, you know, and to keep going when something is hard. You know, you might know what it's like to start something new that you're not so good at. You know, it can be so discouraging, you know, so discouraging, like whether you're learning, I don't know, to DJ, to play guitar, to write, to paint, you know, and every attempt, you know, that isn't good, you just tell yourself like, okay, like I'm, I'm shit at this, I can't do this, uh, rather than okay, Right now, I'm pretty shitty, but I could get better, yeah. you know, and you just keep going. Um, and I think really that's what prevents so many of us from getting to the places that we want to get to, um, as opposed to a lack of privilege or anything like that. As we see from many of the people who've become successful in the world, you definitely don't need to go to the best schools. You could have definitely grown up poor. You could have definitely not had so much around you. But I think the one thing who pe I think the one thing that people have who manage to um, get themselves out of that system, or sorry, get themselves out of those situations is, um, yeah, persistence and determination. Um, so I don't know if that's resourcefulness, but to me, it's a form of resourcefulness, you know, is being determined, is, is keeping going even though it's difficult and even though you think you're terrible at this thing. You know, you can only not by, be, sorry, you can only not be terrible at this thing by, you know, practicing. What would you say is the most fulfilling part of like being a writer because a lot of people when they think about writing it's, it's a very beautiful um profession but it's also something that a lot of people can see as like drawn out and it can be like you have dry spells where you really can't get a clear thought out but what would you say is the most like fulfilling part of writing because i feel like a lot of people just see it for you know just the profession but it can be very fulfilling like um i think for me um you know, whether people see it or not, because there's so much that I write that people never see, is just, you know, there is absolutely nothing, and I no feeling that compares to having something that's been troubling me in my mind and being able to put it to words. You know, it's like the biggest relief, the biggest thrill that I could, um, yeah, it's nothing to me describe. I mean, sorry, nothing to me compares to that. And so for me, that is the the best, the most rewarding thing, um, maybe secondary to that is, you know, having people resonate with what you say and people of all stripes, you know, that's really uh, wonderful to me that it's not just um, um, people who share my background or my ethnicity or people in my age range, you know, it's really truly people from um, all over and all different types of backgrounds. Um, and that, you know, that sometimes makes me feel like I'm, I'm on course to be doing what I, I, I should be doing or that I'm expressing at least my full humanity. If, if people from 
all walks of life can relate to it, that I'm not expressing just part of my identity or something like that. But yeah, you know, it's uh, the sum of my humanity. Mm. Do you think it's important to preserve some of that, like your your personality just for yourself? Because that's a powerful concept that you touched on, just like a lot of your writing, it doesn't even, you know, go out, you don't post it or tweet it out or re release it to the world. Um, I'm the same way with poetry. It's like majority of the poetry that I write, I, I never like put it out there or publish, but like, what, what is the importance of like preserving some things for yourself? Is it from the space that you do it from that it makes it so easy to preserve it for yourself or what is the importance of that? Yeah, it is important. I don't think, um, yeah, everything is for everyone. Some things are just for me to, to you know, untie knots, personal knots um, and feel some sense of relief. Um, some things are not necessarily, you know, some things could be shared at a later date, but the way I may have first written it is for me, you know, and if I'm going to share it with other people and if I want them to maybe understand it, maybe it needs uh, a little bit more editing and, and yeah, just arranging from me. Um, but no, I, I do think it's important just to have things for you um, and to know that you can write not just for the validation of other people. You know, I haven't really been very active online in the last few years. And I'm, a big part of that is to make sure that like, I actually still want to do this thing when nobody's seeing it. Like it actually still has value to me when there's no audience and there's no retweets and, and things like that. I have to also, I, I you know, I, I don't always trust my own motivations. You know, I think we should be curious at least about our own motivations sometimes. You know, and I had to go through a period where I had to make sure that, you know, what I was doing was coming from the right place. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I, I don't share everything, is to, to make sure that I'm still good with who I am and what I'm doing, even, other, even if other people can't see it. Do you think social media could be better if we, like, run ideas by people in our own social group before we, like, put it out to the world? Oh, 100%. I do that. I yeah, mean, I do that. It's like Most, filtering process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, like, two people in my life uh, where a lot of the time before I say something online, I might cross-check it with them. I might say, even it just sense-checking, does this make sense to you? Um, because a lot of the ways that I may write for myself, like... I get it, but it may not always be the clearest. So I check that out. And sometimes I even have, you know, a close friend in particular who's like, mm, yeah, are you sure? Yeah, cool, it makes sense. But like, are you still there? Is that really the energy that you want to attract right now? <laughs> you know, like, is that, do you need to say that? You know, has this come from this kind of place? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it has. <laughs> how, can, how, how do you find those people that can give you that sound advice? Like, I guess we have a very unfiltered relationship, an unfiltered, yeah, way of connecting with each other. There's no judgment. Um, it's very open, we're very close. How do you get that? I think, I think because I've, I mean, I've never really been a person who's very good at small talk and things like that. And so I guess if you do get in my life and we become friends, like, yeah, often it's going to be quite heavy, a lot of the things that we talk about and, I guess it's just because no judgment between us. And I think, you know, she knows what I struggle with. She knows um, my insecurities. She knows what I want to achieve. She knows what sometimes stops me from doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, we, we try to, I don't know if it's holding each other accountable, but we try to make sure that we're both living up to our highest ideals. Mm. And how do you decide what area that, or is, there are areas in life that unity or group think is important and like how do we go about like finding where those areas may be yeah I don't know that's a good question I think that's a really good question actually uh, it will probably stick with me for the rest of the day um maybe there is um I did want to ask you what, what do you feel like is uh one the most important word and why like what, what is if you could choose one word that is like the most important to you? What is it and why? Uh, I can imagine me watching this back and really regretting yeah, You don't have to stick this. to it, just one of them. One of the most important <laughs> well, words no, I'm gonna you. say, I'm gonna say, and it's an important word for all of us, but at the same time, we all struggle with it. Um, personally, um, with other people. So I think I'm gonna say love. Um, and also because in this 
highly politicized climate that we live in, I think, you know, many of us feel that there's no space for it. But love, you know, it sort of, it beautifies everything that you do. It changes the way that you look at things, you know. I, I don't think I would have, I wouldn't be here speaking to you. I wouldn't have many of the opportunities that I've had in recent years. People wouldn't know me or be able to read me if it wasn't for, you know, love, you know, really driving me to um, do the things that I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, and also, you know, what is love? We still, no one has an agreed upon definition. It's still something that, you know, um, you know, many are thinkers, try and wrestle with, you know, how to practice it, how to give it to ourselves, how to give it sufficiently to another person. Um, but yeah, I just think it's the source of um, so much and the lack of it is also the source of so much that we deal with. So I think love is, is very important. And it's also very like, in some ways, like unless we're talking about dating, like it's also like really uncool. Mm. <laughs> you know, and to think and to talk about love publicly, you know, it's quite idealistic and like I think it seems quite wide eyed to a lot of people and a bit naive. Cheapened too, it's been cheapened. Yeah, 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 I think so. And I think because it's been seen as this naive, wide eyed concept by people who consider themselves to be really sophisticated, um, I think that's also why it's today at least um, an important word. Um, because I think a lot of people who consider themselves to be sophisticated thinkers, you know, that is what they're lacking, you know, and that is why their ideas don't land with a lot of people, because it's not coming from a place of love, you know. We can feel resentment whether we can articulate it or not, and we can feel bitterness and all of those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, I think trying to infuse love back into what you're doing, what you're saying, how you approach people, really changes um, changes what your life looks like, you know? I don't have everything, but I feel, and there's still many things that I'd like to achieve, but I really feel like blessed to kind of live a life where, I don't know, so many people are good to me and I meet great people all the time, even in the short while that I've been here in Atlanta, you know, I've, I've spoken to people and had some really beautiful interactions. And I really think this is because of like, um, I try to move with love. And that doesn't mean being a pushover. That doesn't mean, um, I don't know, agreeing with people to, to not upset them. It doesn't mean, yeah, being passive in any way. Um, I think it just means, I don't know, remembering people are a lot like you and not. Mm, I love that. Well, Aisha, I appreciate you sitting down and sharing space with us. And um, make sure you guys stay tuned for more powerful conversations.